Egyptian German political scientist and author Hamid Abdel Samad is one of Germany's best known Muslim media pundits and at the same time one of the country's most popular critics of Islam. His critical view on Islam and Islamic fascism has also made him a target for Islamic terror attacks and he is therefore under constant police protection. Today, Hamad Abdel Samad speaks about Muhammad's importance for today's Muslims and the consequences linked to being critical of the founder of Islam. 1400 years after his death, Muhammad still has a dominant influence on Muslims' lives today. In connection with the mass rapes in Cologne on New Year's Eve, he linked the attacks closely to Muslim culture. He also linked it to the view on men's sexuality and the sexual frustration that many young Muslim men are the carriers of and which clashes violently with the norms of Western democracies. The massive influx of Muslim migrants to Europe during recent years is bound to increase these contradictions and Hamad Abdel Samad places this development within an Islamic frame of explanation with references to the Prophet Muhammad and his continued importance as a political figure, even today. Please give him a warm welcome. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for this nice introduction. Thank you. Uh, the Free Press Society for inviting me um, for my second speech in Denmark. I had one like uh, some years ago in Copenhagen. Today on the way I was thinking no single being will be in the tent <laughs> because it was raining and it's cold, but it seems that Danes are different. Danes are different in many uh, aspects. I said this word already after the Muhammad cartoons were published. Um, I thought this country has a certain sense of freedom, which is different. As I followed the discussion in Denmark after that, I figured out that there is a conflict within the country itself between people who are in the name of freedom are publishing the cartoons and people who are in the name of freedom wants to silence and stop this kind of art which might hurt the feelings of Muslims. I myself, 10 years later, became uh, in the middle of such a discussion. I was publishing a book with the title The Case Against Muhammad, which is dealing with the founder of Islam from a critical point of view. And many people were asking me, why? Why do you do that? And my answer was always, because you are asking me. Because you wouldn't have asked me if this book was called Jesus, the case against Jesus, or the case against Moses, or the case against Buddha, or the case against Elvis Presley. You would accept any criticism of any historical figure. You wouldn't even mind you would consider it as freedom of research, freedom of art, freedom of opinion. But when it comes to Muhammad, you make a political issue out of it, and you don't want me to do so. Some people used to tell me, the prophet is the last stone of identity of us. Why do you attack it? Let him in peace. And I always answer to my Muslim friends who tell me that. And I say, maybe he became the last stone of your identity because you left him in peace for 1,400 years. 
because nobody ever dared to come closer to him. Nobody ever dared, dared to criticize his biography. Well, there is a big debate in the academic world right now if Muhammad ever existed or not. And there, is, there are two camps, both are strong camps, and both have strong arguments. I'm referring to this conflict in my book, but my book is not about the, only the historic Muhammad, but Muhammad as a narrative which is influencing the life of 1.5 billion people today. If you will see most of the problems in the Islamic world, you can relate it not only to Muhammad, but also to Muhammad and his behavior. The way he was dealing with unbelievers, uh, the way he was, believing with Christ, uh, was dealing with Christians and Jews, the way he was dealing with women, the, we, the way he was dealing with Christianity, even the way he was acting when he was going to the toilet. All of this became a huge manual, a holy manual for many Muslims, not all of them, but for many Muslims who are acting exactly according to these kind of instructions. Why is it important to criticize Muhammad today? Because I respect Muslims. I take them seriously. Many people would think if you respect Muslims, you should not criticize their prophet. They might get angry. Once you pronounce his name, they get so emotional. You remember this scene? I don't know what uh, um, was it Monty Python or the faulty the, the John Cleese. Forty the, towers. For, Forty towers, exactly. Don't mention the war. There was like a, a German woman. Whenever she is reminded by Second World War, she was crying. So and. Like, everybody in the hotel was always taking care. Don't mention the war. Don't mention the war, otherwise she will start crying and she will feel offended. And this is the way we look at Muslims. We think we should not criticize the prophet, otherwise they will get wild like an angry child and they will start throwing stones at us. I refuse this concept of human beings. I take people serious, and I criticize, and I was called racist because of this. But for me, the real racist is the one who look at Muslims as children. I call this soft racism, the soft bigotry of lowered expectations. You look at Muslim and think, we cannot expect the same from them like we expect from our enlightened people. They are not so far. They are not grown ups yet. That's racism. And that comes many times from the left side, not from the right wing, who always need somebody to protect. They used to protect the plutaria in the past. And then as the plutaria was uh, disappearing almost from the world, they start to protect the third world and as the expression third world is not used anymore, they need somebody to protect and to be the lawyer of. Now it's the Muslims, now it's the immigrants. And this is not the society I want to live in. I want to live in an open society where everybody is equal in negative and in positive sense. No special rights for anyone and no lowered expectations for the other groups. That's why. I'm doing that. But in the West, and especially in Europe, it's becoming always tougher to criticize Islam for many reasons. The first reason is the political and economic, uh, economic opportunism of the politicians who have businesses with Saudi Arabia, with Qatar, with Emirates, with Turkey, with Iran. They are selling weapons, and they don't want their partners to get angry. Therefore, they say Islam is the religion of peace. That's it. As if we don't have eyes, 
I don't, as if we don't read news, as if we don't know what's going on in the world. This is one reason, the opportunism of the politicians. The second level is, of course, the lobbyism taking place in the media, in the politics, and even in the academic world, which is sad enough that many research projects when it comes to Islamic studies are funded or supported by Gulf states like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Emirates. They are even funding whole research institutes in the United States and in Europe to push the topics of Islamophobia, Islam and democracy are compatible and things like that. So whenever they hear or read a book like mine, the first reflection even before they read it is, this is not academic. <laughs> um, this is not, um, it's not, it's not containing enough arguments. Or if you happen to have a white skin, then you are racist automatically. So there is a tactic always. If you are European, you are racist. You are Nazi, or you don't understand the Quran, or you have the wrong translation. If you are um, a critic with Muslim backgrounds, who understands the Quran very good, who knows the Hadith and the Islamic history like he knows his own fingers, then you are a self-hating Muslim. Then you are um, having a problem with your own psychology. They will find always a way to criticize your criticism of Islam because it doesn't fit to their societal concepts. Politicians are afraid of criticism of Islam because of two things. Not only to, because the connection to uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, but also because they have misconceptions of Muslims living in their society and with their own people. They think Muslims will get angry and the right wing will get violent, then we will have problems with violence in the society. So they don't think in a larger context and think this is freedom. And we have to go through this. Like we went through enlightenment in Europe. We, didn't, we, we haven't done that with knife and fork and with, uh, uh, while drinking coffee. It was a tough process. And the bitter cup that Europe was drinking to go through the Enlightenment cannot be spared for Muslims. We need this too. We have to have these discussions too. Otherwise, we will, the, the problems will get tougher and tougher. And that's what I'm seeing right now. The more terror attacks we are having, the more criticism of Islam is becoming unwelcome. The more we feel we need to protect Muslims than protect ourselves from Muslim fundamentalists. I remember a scene which annoyed me so much after the November attacks in Paris, killing over 130 people. There was an event to mourn the victims in Place de la République in, uh, in France, in Paris. And people were bringing uh, candles and flowers, and they were silent. And the whole stage was conquered by a young Muslim who was blindfolded, who was opening his arms and saying, Islam is peace, I'm not a terrorist, hug me. Uh, this annoyed me so much because he converted an event to mourn the victims of Islamic hate, hatred, into an Islamic public relation event. Islam is nice. Come and hug me. I am actually the victim. <laughs> Forget those who died. I am the victim because you look like this at me. So this logic is increasing. Just like after the other Paris attack happened, killing the Charlie Hebdo uh, redactions, redactors, and killing um, some other clients of a Jewish um, supermarket. The politicians in France were not going the next day and visiting the redactors of a, a newspaper or of a Jewish community. They were going to a mosque 
to show solidarity with Muslims. Uh, and then they are proving to them, yes, dear Muslims, you are actually the victims. You are the victims of everything, even when Muslims are killing us. You are the victims. And this is not a way to deal with grown-ups. The best way to deal with grown-ups is to be honest to them and to say the truth, or at least what you think to be the truth. And that's exactly what I have done with my book about Muhammad. I have been portraying a man who is very controversial, who is having at least two sides, one side which is peaceful and compassionate, and one side which is violent and inconsiderate. I was calling him a mass murderer because the Islamic texts themselves are depicting him as a mass murderer and even celebrating this mass murder against the Jews. I was trying to find a connection between some modern diseases in the Islamic society and Muhammad's psychology. And remember always, I'm talking about that narrative of Muhammad, which is available to every Muslim in the world. The story that everybody knows. I was saying that the disease of paranoia started with Muhammad, who was considering the rest of the world conspiring against him and his community. And he was injecting his community with this attitude. Don't trust Jews and Christians because they're conspiring against us. The unbelievers are filthy. Don't get closer to them. That's the attitude which is generating generations of Islamic fundamentalists today. Looking at unbelievers, people who are not accepting Islam, everyone is unbeliever, as filthy people. This is not humanistic, and this is cannot, can never be the basis for living together. And this is building a high wall between Muslims and the rest of the world, and that's making integration and the coherence of the society not possible. So I try, I'm trying to connect this with this, then I become a racist. I was depicting the disease of hatred, where it comes from. It comes from the psychology of a man who wanted to be recognized. Muhammad was always longing for recognition. And he was offering a peaceful message, but was not accepted. So he turned his strategy and became violent. He started to wage wars. He started to live from war spoils. And after he had done so, he became respected because people were afraid of his sword. And this was creating an Islamic economy which is still surviving until IS. <laughs> Waging wars killing people, taking spoils of wars, taking women, selling them as slaves, and make an economy. This is how the Islamic economy was going on until the Osman Empire, and now it's extended by the extremists of IS and Boko Haram. Exactly the same idea of economy. And it started with Muhammad. And I am trying to explain in this book that it's not only what's written in the text. And it's not only what Muhammad has done, but it's the position of the text today for today's Muslim, and the position of Muhammad for the Muslim identity as the last remaining stone of their identity. That's the reason. The Orlando attack is the best example for that, the best example how apologetics can work. The one who has done it is a Muslim. He has done it in the holy month of Ramadan, which is known for jihad and such attacks all over the world. He was showing his sympathy to IS just before doing this attack. But the first reactions were coming out. It's a single case. Um, 
it has nothing to do with Islam. As if somebody was talking to him before and asked him, Omar, my friend, why, why, why are you planning that? Oh, no, I, I hate uh, homosexuals and I just want to kill 50 of them without telling them him anything. But he was talking about his religion. And then the next level is relativism. While also in the Old Testament, you will find some passages condemning homosexuals. Yes, sure. Uh, in fact, we Muslims, we took this story from the Bible. But it is not just the text. Because when it comes to the Bible and the Quran, you have two different texts. The, anyone who would today would say the Bible is the literal word of God containing instructions for daily life. All of us, I hope so, will call him fundamentalist, right? Because Christians all over the world have learned to look at the text as having a human side uh, containing the interpretation of the writer of the text, containing his own language, containing his own maybe problems. <laughs> and there is no instruction saying after the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, go Good Jew or good Christian, go and kill homosexuals. There is nothing like this. But when it comes to the Quran, it's a different position. Every Muslim who accepts Islam must recognize Quran as the exact word of God that has never been changed, not even a single letter, which is containing the last manifest to human beings. The last manifest how to live, how to deal with others, how to love, how to marry, how to eat, how to drink, who to love, who to hate, even how to act when you are on the toilet. Everything. Everything. And it contains the concept that a good Muslim is a Muslim who is changing the world with his hand who is not accepting the sin to take place around him. One of the most famous sentences of the Quran is, God is speaking to the Muslims and saying to them, you are the best community that have ever been brought to humanity because you are doing the good and you are forbidding the evil. In a very famous hadith, means a, a, a saying of the prophet Muhammad. He's saying, whenever you see a sin, you should change it with your hand, or with your tongue, or at least with your heart, but this is the weak belief. So the strong belief is you change the sin with your hand. So the problem is now not the text, what's written there, because we will find problematic passages in all religions, because they are from archaic times. And they are made mostly by men. So you'll find these problematic passages. But what is the position of the text? What is the expectation of the text to the believers? What is the political order? behind this text, the political expectation. So the text in Islam is always offering an option for acting. Don't go through the world with your heart. You should go with your hand, and you should be always ready to change. That, that's what Muhammad did, according to his biography. That's what his followers did after he died. That's what has been taking place all over the Islamic history. And that's what the fundamentalists are doing today when they are killing people, when they are compromising human rights, women rights, in the name of Muhammad. And therefore, I consider Muhammad criticism today not only as a human right, but as a human duty. Every human being who loves humanity who loves peace, who wants us to live together, including Muslims, 
must criticize Islam and must criticize Muhammad. The fact that The fact that I need to stress that in the 21st century is showing that we are having a problem. The fact that you are inviting me to speak about Muhammad today, the fact that I have to be protected by all of these people, the fact that my words might hurt the feelings of people, all of this is a clear reason why we should continue criticizing Islam. And I'm always stressing something. I'm always saying we should always differentiate between ideology and people. We should never fall into the trap of considering every Muslim to be a Quran on two legs. There are many, many open-minded Muslims. There are many Muslims who are accepting criticism, who are reacting to that. I don't publish my books only in Arabic, but also in, uh, and only in German or, or English or, or other languages, but also in Arabic and in Persian, and I get feedback. I have a YouTube channel. I've been criticizing Muhammad on this channel like never before. This channel has been visited within a few months by 4.5 million people, young Muslims, who are discussing with me. Some are angry, but some are saying, you, you've got a point. And there is a big debate taking place. It's a painful debate, but it has to go on. I don't need an American president who will come and stop this debate and say, like, Islam has absolutely nothing to do with violence. He's stopping those people who are start to think about the problem, the homegrown problem. We don't need patronize patronization of anybody. We don't, want, we don't need patrons. We need people who will incite us to think. We don't incite to violence. We incite to think. One of the reasons why the Muhammad criticism and Islam criticism um, is stopped very fast, especially in Europe and in the West in general, is because there is kind of a emotional blackmailing. Um, don't criticize Islam, otherwise you'll be supporting the right wing. And I've been always asked, same questions, wherever I go in Europe. Aren't you afraid that your book will be misused by the right wing to incite violence against Muslims in Europe? They are the same people, the same people, after, who would come after every terror attacks by Islamists and will say, those Islamists were misusing the Quran for their violence. <laughs> so when they come to me with this argument, I told them, if Allah, the Almighty, is not able to protect his book against misuse, how can I, poor human being, do that? I can't. <laughs> I can't. That's the logic of them. Aren't you afraid? So you have been protecting the Quran and saying, the people who were killing were shouting Allahu Akbar and they were reciting the Quran. The people who are taking the rights of human beings and women rights away are reciting the Quran. I'm asking them, when was the last time that you saw somebody slaughtering somebody reciting my book. <laughs> so which book is actually dangerous? Why are, why are you warning against my book and you're not warning against the book which is used as manual for killing? Where is the logic? Where is the logic? I understand freedom because I paid a big price for this freedom. I'm still paying a big fr uh, price for this freedom. And I'm ready to pay any price it takes. Many people are trying to silence me. I don't get silenced. And I don't get silenced by threatening. And that's what I expect from Europe. It's my last oasis. <laughs> and it's the oasis of many people who left 
those autocratic and violent societies and came here to speak up their minds freely. All of the people who think like me, that I know, who speak publicly, all of them are living under police protection. This is a scandal. And at the end, they are considered to be the problem. They are just the messengers. They are just coming and saying, take care. Tolerance against intolerance is stupidity. It's not tolerance. The best protections for everyone also for Muslims in Europe, is that we speak up our minds and that we be honest with them and with ourselves. Consider them as equals. So if we are having no problem to criticize Jesus or Christianity or Moses or Judaism or any other religion, why should it be Muhammad and Islam to have this special position? Did Muhammad deserve this position? From my point of view, absolutely no. He caused much misery in the history and in the present time, and he doesn't deserve this, our consideration. We should look with respect to human being, but respecting human being doesn't mean respecting every garbage they think about. That doesn't mean that we respect every ideology they believe in. It's not a, a, to, a whole package that we have to buy. No, I respect you, I respect your mind, but I think your religion has a lot of problems and that's pr problem number one, problem number two, problem number three. That's how I understand respect. Not that I consider you to be a little child who cannot deal with criticism. This is not respect. And I see this phenomena increasing. I see it at school, young students who are not able to pronounce the word Islam, otherwise their Muslim friends will flip out. I see it from teachers who cannot discuss freely in classrooms anymore, otherwise there will be uh, emotional blockade. I see it with politicians and I see it with even artists and writers who have to think twice before publishing something that is having uh, the image of Kaaba or the name of the prophet Muhammad. I think 220 years after Voltaire and after Kierkegaard and Grundwey and Spinoza, Kierkegaard, <laughs> and all of the pioneers of enlightenment we should not roll back. We should not roll back. We are in a very crucial time. I think many Muslims need this atmosphere of free speech here so that they can make a difference in their societies. So don't fail them in the name of freedom and don't mix freedom with cowardice. We should speak up, we should be clear about what we think, and that's exactly the point. Those who are fighting for evil, those who are fighting for ignorance, are more secure about their attitude than those who are fighting for freedom, and this cannot be the result. We should be as enthusiastic about freedom, as passionate, about defending freedom as they are passionate for defending their crazy ideology. Thank you for listening and I'm looking forward for a good discussion. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that very good speech. Uh, questions? Er der nogen, der vil spørge noget? Okay, I have a question. Okay, yeah, Marianne. I have a question. Thank you very much. Yeah, here we go. The rain is... Thank you very much, Smith. 
When I was uh, standing on the street inviting people in, uh, I told them that you would say something about what happened uh, New Year's Eve in uh, uh, Köln and uh, other places in, in Germany. Could you say something about that? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a long story, of course. I'll try to make it short on the New Year celebration in the city of Cologne and in, in eight other German cities, not only in Cologne. Um, we witnessed uh, in Germany for the first time in history a phenomena that this society never uh, saw before in this dimension. Thousands of immigrants were attacking young women, were sexually harassing them, raping them, uh, robbing them. Thousands of cases. Um, the first reflection was after that, uh, this has nothing to do with Islam. This was the first thing I heard from every representative of a Muslim community. They don't think about the victim first. They don't think about how can we stop such actions to be repeated. No. The first important thing is Islam is innocent. That's the first statement. And of course, they have a good argument. They say, in Islam, um, it's not allowed to touch a woman which is not your wife. And it's not even allowed to look at her. And that's true, that if you, see, if you, if you take the texts, it is like this. But when I was writing that it still has something to do with Islam, Islam is the strongest power for ideas and for emotions in the Islamic world. So take it as a rule. It always has something to do with Islam, <laughs> whatever happens there. Because it's the strongest, it's the engine of the society. Yes, Islam doesn't allow man to touch a woman, but Islam is creating an atmosphere, a societal atmosphere, which is letting women be in that position to be a victim of violence. First of all, Islam is allowing a, a husband to beat his wife. Islam is asking a woman to stay at her home and not to go out in the public, and not, of course, midnight. So by doing so, she is, um, she is the victim, but we should blame her. And this is what's happening in the Islamic world when sexual harassment is taking place. If you look at the top 10 countries known for sexual harassment in the world, you will find nine Islamic countries among them. The only non-Islamic country among them is India. And Islam is expecting a woman not to be a part of the public space, to leave that. So once she is leaving the public space, she is, uh, we say Zelberschuld in Germany, it's, it's her own uh, sin. It, she shouldn't have done that. It's her own guilt. And there was one imam in Cologne who was saying the young Muslims felt provoked by these young women because they were putting perfumes. It might sound funny, but that's what he said. And that's what the prophet was saying. If a woman would put perfume and go out, and men will smell her, then she has committed adultery. So now you see the logic. A religion which is accepting intimidation of women, is not allowing her to be a part of the public space, is even blaming her for putting perfume, is creating an atmosphere for a young Muslim to attack her whenever she is um, doing something against these rules, as long as she's not adhering to these rules. This is one part. This is all of these arguments in case she's a Muslim woman. If she's a non-Muslim woman, then she is a project of to be a spoil of war, to be a sex slave of the Muslim conqueror who will take her as a spoil of war. And that's what Muhammad did. He was taking women as spoils of war, was dividing them among his friends. Anyone by accident can just sleep with her because she was falling as a 
spoil of war. So when a young Muslim is immigrating and he's having this mental map in his mind, it's a mental map, thinking a Muslim woman who is not acting according to Islamic rules is, I'm allowed to touch her. And if she is an unbeliever woman, anyway, Quran is saying about unbeliever that they're filthy and that they're not trustable and that we should not be friends with them. So if Allah, the Almighty, is planning to burn you in hell, why should I respect you? Why should I be friends with you? So it doesn't make sense. So if, if Allah hates you, so if Allah hates you, <laughs> he will send you a tractor to annoy you. <laughs> While you are speaking. <laughs> so if Allah hates you, why should I love you? If Allah is planning to burn you, why should I have any kind of compassion with you? So I either hate you like my God, or I do so as if I love you, but in my heart I still hate you. <laughs> this is how it works. This is how it works, and this is how it happened. I don't want to get so much into the refugee crisis because I'm very frustrated about it. <laughs> um, I am always on the side of human rights, and every human being who um, is coming from wars or from oppression has the right, of course, to apply for asylum. But I think Europe in general, and especially Germany, um, is going now through a social experiment and a political experiment that nobody can predict how it will end. And it will change the geography and the mental geography of the society. The common sense that we were used to is starting to change. And I think the debate about Islam is showing that. We could discuss about everything in the past without being afraid. Now, intellectuals are either afraid to discuss this issue, or they are supporting the wrong side in the name of tolerance. And the more Muslim immigrants you will be having in Europe, the more free thinkers will be under stress and under attack. So that's my concern. We have started an experiment, and I have no idea where we are heading to. Goodwill is not enough. So you need to be prepared. You need to prepare your own society for people who are coming. You need to prepare people who are entering your country from the beginning, that they need to give up a part of their authentic culture before they come in. If you are not honest enough to say this sentence, it's too late. You cannot have both. You cannot have European identity, European protection, plus Islam 100%. You have to give up a part of your authentic identity if you want to be a European. That's my experience. And everybody who didn't accept this fact is still fighting, is still an object and can convert and can turn into a fundamentalist overnight because they didn't make this decision. They didn't know what it means to leave their country and to live in a society like Europe. So that's what the message I'm always giving to the politician and to the Muslims who are entering. Think twice before entering here. Don't think that you can import all the dogmas and ideas that destroyed your country and implanted here in the name of freedom of religion. And everybody who is supporting those people to do so in the name of tolerance, they are our enemies. Even they use the word tolerance. Even they call us racist. They are our enemies because they are supporting intolerance to grow. They are offering intolerance an infrastructure to build its home because they think this is how tolerance should be.
Hi. Um, you, as, as you can see, first of all, I'm not so good to English. I will, I will try and I hope you all understand what I mean. Um, I'm 46 and I'm from Iran and I'm Muslim. I have been in the Quran school in my childness, eight years, and I study Arabic and Quran in university in Iran. You have some good point. Um, people like you and Ahmad Akari, of course you know him, he's my friend too, and I read his books too. Both of you have a point, but I think you have to remember just other uh, side of, uh, especially women cases, as you um, tell me now. Um, in, in the Denmark, uh, uh, how much Danish government need to use money to protect everyone who uh, agree with you? If, if me as a Muslim woman write a book like you, and I need protection as you, how many people Danish government have to protect because they agree with you? Yeah. And you have to remember, first step, people, Muslim people come here, they have a big problem or challenge with integration to the Westly um, um, culture. That was a big problem. One uh, Muslim woman in the Aarhus, in the Gelderop, who I work in, the biggest ghetto in the Europe, M maybe many women agree with you and your book, but what they can to do with the five children, with the challenge, with the language, yeah. with the culture, with the working, and blah, blah, and blah, blah. They yeah. don't need new book and they don't need new criticize uh, side of the Islam because they know it. Believe me, many people like me, like you, they know it, but what they can do because I, as I said to you, when they are coming here, they lost many things in their country and they are alone and they have they, each other. Okay. If they are coming out from this and they be alone more than them. Yeah. I, I, got, I got your point. It's a very good point, of course. Uh, the first question, how many people should the Danish government or German government protect? I, my opinion, everyone who is um, endangered, who is threatened, should be protected because it's not just a protection of their own <laughs> bodies. It's a protection of our freedom. It's a protection of enlightenment of what uh, we are calling uh, freedom of speech. And to uh, maybe save money for the government, everybody who thinks the same like me should be outspoken about it. She should say it openly. Then we are too many. Then the fundamentalists are, cannot locate us. If we are just five, they know. He lives in this city and he lives in this city, let's kill them. But when we are 500, 5,000, 500,000, then, they cannot do that anymore, then the state doesn't need to protect us. Um, what can we do to young women or women who are um, having this um, kind of uh, situation? They don't read books and they don't maybe hear about me. That's the job of schools, that the children will not be indoctrinated by what made their society go astray. What destroyed this, what is the thing that destroyed their societies? Lack of freedom, lack of education. So that's what they need to learn here. Freedom and education. And I'm not saying that only about the young Muslims or uh, Muslim from Muslim countries or from background, Muslim backgrounds. Also for young Danes, like the biological Danes. They, the children need to learn at school to appreciate freedom and not to be scared by the logic of power. That when somebody is threatening them, they should shut their mouth. No, they should be trained, educated and trained to defend their freedom and not to accept intimidation. And this is something which is going deeper into Europe. I today heard that in Paris, women 
who are taking the metro, the subway, they start to cover their bodies. In the past, Paris was the city of freedom. Everybody could walk freely, but because they get harassed by certain group of people, uh, people with southern looking, <laughs> yeah, these are the political correct things, southern. Yeah, are they from Cuba or from Italy? These are also southern countries. No? We know, but you know, I know, and you know, but we should not use the word. So we should just like say, no, we are not going to accept that. Women should wear what they like to wear. Children should say what they like to say and should not be scared just because there's someone who is using the logic of violence. No, all of us should unite and should teach Muslim students and Danish students Swedish students, German students, to be firm about their freedom, not to accept intimidation. That's why I'm here. Somebody would, might ask me, why are you taking all of this uh, long distance to come? I, I really came 9,000 kilometers for this speech. And I knew it's a tent, and some people might attend. But I take freedom seriously. I take freedom seriously. and. If I would just sit at home in such a rainy day, and if you prefer to have a good beer or stay in your warm room and watch uh, the football uh, game uh, of Sweden and Italy, sorry for Sweden, or I, I, I guess you are happy for it, is it? <laughs> I, you never know, you know? <laughs> you never know in Denmark <laughs> on which side you, uh, you are. It starts by the individual. So it's not a question of a book. My book is a symbol of a state of mind. And my state of mind is, I don't get intimidated. I write a book, you threaten me, I write two other book books. <laughs> and live with it. But if I will just allow myself to be silenced by this. So the next thing is, that will go to the next author, who is even milder than myself in criticizing Islam. And they will stop him, and he will get intimidated. And they will not accept any other writer, because radicals accept only their voice, their own voice to be heard. Otherwise, they don't accept anything else. OK. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, I'll start with uh, a Danish sentence. I was invited here as a uh, opposing view. Um, I'm not so sure we are disagreeing in so much, but my Danish sentence is, hvorfor bliver jeg ved med at invitere udlændinge her til sidste år, hvor det vildt at stille noget, jeg troede var en dansk folkefest, politisk folkefest. Ikke? Har vi ikke udlænding nok i Danmark? Kan vi ikke klare det selv? Okay, det var mit drillende spørgsmål. Ikke? Um, ja, jeg mener ikke... Nej, okay. I'll get to the point now. I just did something to you we Danes often do. We don't speak to our foreigners we speak above them, you know, yeah. uh, etc. And this is the point I'm getting to here. I'm, a, first of all, I have worked for years and years in America in a very multi-religious society, uh, standing in fundamentalist uh, Christian universities day after day and Jewish universities, etc., etc. And one thing I've learned is um, you can get very far with people, and uh, but you can't criticize a religion. People love the religion they're born into. And uh, so all critiques should always come from the inside. Now, I am part of a, a, a Danish group called Critical Muslims and Female um, Imams, where we take on uh, the patriotic, uh, patriotic uh, tyranny of the Danish imams, you know, by um, creating the first uh, female mosque in Denmark and many other things. We have for years worked uh, de-radicalizing uh, 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 fundamentalists in the uh, here in Denmark, which is not allowed in Germany, uh, etc. And uh, we work closely with the Quilliam Foundation in uh, England and so on. Had great results. But the only way we can do it is with a loving approach, with cri critique coming from the inside, you know, from uh, very well-educated Muslims. Can we get Muslims. to the question, please? Yeah, get yeah. to the question. 
very well educated uh, Muslims who have a loving approach to it, you know, then you can change people. Then we all can agree that religion should be reformed and under critique. Yeah. But if you don't criticize it from the inside, then comes this attitude which too many Muslims in Denmark have adopted against the society, they don't feel love them and so on. Mm. So therefore, my question is, what is the purpose of criticizing from the um, outside? You do it Both from the inside and also from the outside, but many Danes do it from the We're outside the and question. then we don't accomplish anything. We want to change. I understood. I understood your point. Uh, the first saying we should um, we should not talk uh, about uh, foreigner. We should talk with uh, them. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to engage through my criticism, but uh, not through hugging. I know the. Uh, I've been invited many times to uh, this kind of peaceful dialogue uh, events where like some Jew and some Christian and some Muslim come and recite some passages of the Quran and Torah and the New Testament about tolerance and peace. And then they hug each other and they go home and nothing has changed. This kind of dialogue is not effective. It's, it's counterproductive. The other point is uh, criticism should be only from inside. I don't agree. Um, can, can I allow a Yazidi woman who has been raped to criticize Islam or not? Does she have to be loving Islam to criticize Islam? No. It should be, Islam is a world heritage and is causing troubles not only to Muslims. It's causing troubles to all the world. When we are going to airports now, why all of us are searched firmly? It's not because of the Buddhists. It's not because of the Hindus. It's because groups of Muslims were causing the terrorism. When we are seeing the headlines day after day and after day, and it's getting more and more and more. Which is, which, which is the religion which is occupying our minds all the time? We can, I can accept your saying, if Islam is a religion which is practiced only in the private rooms, but Islam is, uh, is uh, uh, imposing itself in our schools, in our public spaces, is having certain attitudes, want to change certain aspects of our societies that we have been accepting all the time. There has been always a common sense in Europe about freedom, about criticizing religion, and we were living good with that until Muslims start to immigrate here and they wanted to push certain attitude. I don't say all Muslims, but some of them, especially those who are attending those events of uh, religious dialogues, they speak their mind. They know in their heart, I hate you because Allah will send you to hell. But he has to smile because he needs money of the government and he needs to have some peace. He doesn't want to look as a bad guy. But when they are sitting together and when they are preaching, when, when they are among each other and nobody understands Danish or nobody understands Arabic, then you, you have a totally different uh, attitude and I don't agree with this they and we and all of this. We already agreed. Do, do you accept Muslims as Danes or not? They are Danes, right? Then we should deal with them like all other the Danes. We make fun of everything. We make fun of everything, including Muhammad. <laughs> deal? <laughs> OK. Thank you. We we're running out of time. Uh, very short, but, but, but before you go ahead, Lone, I we were running out of time. I was I said we were asking a, a, a question in Danish. So okay. I need to answer in Danish. Okay. Um, I'll just say that yeah, we have invited folk from outside. Det er fordi vi orienterer os i trykkefredsselskabet ikke bare indad til i forhold til vores eget lille land men vi også er internationalt orienteret. Men vi har jo rent faktisk haft flere danske på Tryggefredsselskabet. Vi havde Morten Storm, og vi har haft Lars Hedegaard. Så øh, det er svaret. Yes, a short question from Lone. Thank you very much for your speech. It was so clear. 
And just one question, how did you arrive at this uh, insight? And uh, I mean, could you describe very, uh, it will in, 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 not in detail, but um, very many Muslims are intelligent people. Why don't they follow your track? <laughs> Maybe many people are following more than you think, but it's the fear. It's the fear that they don't come out. I am in contact with many people, many, many people through my channel that I figured out I'm not alone. There are plenty of people, millions from the Arab world who think so, but they cannot speak it out. How I arrived there, it's a long path. It's starting by understanding the contradiction the contradictions of my own religion. I was a very religious person. My father was an imam. I learned the Quran by heart when I was a child. I studied everything you can imagine about Islam. And that's why fundamentalists hate me. Because they know um, they cannot use the usual uh, arguments with me that you don't understand or you have the wrong translation. Like, so I start to look at the contradictions. Like, if there is a God, and he wants something from me. What could it be? It can never be that I will hate my neighbor. It can never be that I separate the world to believers and unbelievers. It cannot be that he asks me to die for his sake, to be a martyr, to be a jihadi. What for? If there is a God, he will like me. If, if I were a God, I would like people to live in peace together. I will tell them that don't incite violence. I will tell them that there is no pro difference between any race and any religion. And I'm not going to tell the one group, you are the best and the rest are filthy. So this word, the unbelievers are filthy, was stuck in me. How comes that God, who supposedly has created everybody, will call one group his children and other group will call it filthy. Doesn't, didn't make any sense. So once you take the holiness away of the holy text, you start to read it as a human production. You recognize a lot of contradictions and then you say, this text doesn't deserve this power it is having today. And that was moving me to the next ste uh, step. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Five.